There's a well-known quote, I'm certain that most, if not all of you, have heard it before, and the quote is, a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. This saying from 1928 or so has been applied to all sorts of conditions and challenges, whether used in reference to a company or a restaurant menu or our own personal lives, the meaning is generally the same. We're all very wise to remember to move along in life and not get stuck, to be willing to take risks and go out on a limb, and understand that if we stay put and don't change a thing, our God-given potential cannot be fulfilled. We can likely think of numerous examples of when someone, or perhaps we ourselves, played it too safe and opportunities were lost. As human beings, we were not created to stay in safe harbors throughout our lives, but made to venture out into the wild and risky wide open sea. We were made to ride large swells, have salty spray hit our faces, and we are equipped by God to make it through stormy passages. It is evident that our creator, God, often calls us to head out and go, to move beyond what we can see or predict, and to live our lives with a spirit of adventure, curiosity, and wonder. But before I get more into this, I need to offer a few remarks, an essential caveat I hope will, you will keep in mind of all of what I'm about to say shortly. This is a caveat that's really important. When I was a young boy in El Paso, one day I was walking along the street in our neighborhood. It was a very hot, scorching summer day. And as I made my way, I looked ahead and I saw this strange object in the street. And as I walked further along the road, I discovered a rather large desert snapping turtle on its back with its legs waving frantically around. I knew obviously that this turtle would die, not only because of being in that position, but because of being in the street and because of the heat. And so I bent down, I picked the turtle up, and I placed it on a lawn that was nearby. And after a few minutes of looking at the turtle, I said, well, that turtle's probably just likely to go back out into the street, so I've got to take this turtle home, which I did. <laughs> and over the years, he actually became a very good friend. Much to my parents' chagrin, because I would only feed Snappy, I named him, I would only feed Snappy ground sirloin. <laughs> As I think back to Snappy, it seems that many, if not most of us, have been in the position I found him on the street that day. We've all been and had periods in our lives in which we have felt like everything is turned upside down. Whether due to sickness, unemployment, living well beyond a spouse and friends, the vestiges of aging, dealing with death and loss, a huge life transition, managing a growing family that's going in a million directions, or just plain old heartache to live is to be like that upside down turtle at times. To be human means there are those passages we find ourselves in positions we don't like, circumstances that make us scared, frantic, sad, worried, or confused, or happenings that cause us just to want to give up or make us feel like we just want to be done with whatever it is. I've been there. You have been there. Maybe you're there right now, and I get it. And when we are in such places, sometimes what we need most is to grab on to what is familiar, to turn what we have known, to rest in what has been, and to relax in the presence of others who love us like a warm blanket on a cold day. Sometimes what we need most is that meal we've eaten for years, to hear that old hymn, to read the comforting passage, to sit in a chair that is shaped to fit us who we have become, to go to the one street in town that has not changed so much and take a walk, to reminisce, to pull out an old album, to turn the pages of a scrapbook, to take a long nap, to write a letter by hand or simply journey back in time in our minds and remain for as long as we need. Said another way, we may be ships that are made to be out on the water, but sometimes we need to go to a safe harbor and stay for a while. And not only is that okay, but sometimes that's exactly what God calls us to do. Remember Jesus said, come to me all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Stillness, peace, familiarity, a sense of security, resting, 
or docking in a protected marina may be where we need to be for a while. And sometimes Jesus calls us there. I have to say, personally, I've been spending some time in a marina with my closest friends and my family members following the death of my mom a few weeks ago. And I have to say that at first, when I noticed myself seeking comfort in the familiar, for some reason, I began to chastise myself. Robert, come on, get going. And when I said so, I felt disconnected from myself and, in fact, from God. And that's when several people close to me, including my beloved wife, Regina, said, Robert, it's okay to be sad to feel out of sorts, to feel overwhelmed, to let others take on some of your caregiving for a while. And as someone who spends his life caregiving, I realized this is exactly what I needed to hear and to be faithful, and that I had to let go and receive as Jesus wanted me to receive in order to one day feel okay again. So with all of this in mind and that caveat, I want to get back, however, to the idea that we were not made to spend our lives in a safe harbor but to get out into the open sea. And to help us do this, let's turn to our reading from the Gospel of Luke today. This story, which is found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is called the stories of the Transfiguration, as many of you know. And although there are slight differences in the telling of the story in these Gospels, much of what happened, as described in the three, are quite similar. Now, many mainline churches, for those of you who are from a mainline church, know that the Transfiguration is celebrated often right before Lent. We often do the same thing here at the chapel. And the main reason for this, from a church calendar perspective, is that the transfiguration points to the divinity of Jesus, that he was indeed God in the flesh, and that the divinity of Jesus is something to be kept in mind during the season of Lent, leading up to Good Friday and Easter. That said, however, the transfiguration was first celebrated in the context of worship in the fourth century on August 6th, near the site of where some believe the events happened, Mount Tabor in Israel. So given that we're near that date of August 6th, I thought it would be appropriate, as the Eastern Orthodox does, church does, for us to take a look at the story today. A story that followers of Jesus have paid attention to in a church worship context since the 300s. Well, here's a brief look at the story in its context. Jesus and his disciples are together, and Jesus says, who do you think that I am? And among those listening is Peter, who says, Jesus, you are the Messiah. And after confirming Peter's answer, Jesus says, referring to the crucifixion, not too long from now, they're going to kill me. According to Luke, eight days later, this event, Jesus takes his followers, Peter, James, and John, with him up a big mountain. And it's there on the mountain that Jesus is transfigured, means his appearance totally changed. He suddenly looks like something that no one had ever seen before. Matthew, Mark, and Luke say that Jesus' face shined like the sun and his garments became white as light. His clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. It's evident that whatever Jesus' appearance was, it was not of this world. And at that moment, Peter, James, and John, three of Jesus' closest followers, saw Moses and Elijah speaking to Jesus. And when Peter, James, and John saw Moses and Elijah, everything about their Jewish faith would have come alive. In seeing Moses, Peter, James, and John, the Jews, would have thought, Moses, Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, the giving of the Ten Commandments, the wandering around the desert for 40 years, Moses leading the people up to the border of the Promised Land. It would have all come alive, their whole tradition. And upon seeing the prophet Elijah, all of the words of the prophets from Isaiah and from all those so long before would have come racing in their minds. It would have been like a Disneyland of faith of seeing every character they had thought of. It must have been surreal to them. And clearly, while they did not get it at the moment, the presence of Moses and Elijah was confirming not only of their Jewish faith, but of the fact that indeed this was Jesus, the Messiah. Needless to say, Peter, James, and John are blown away and really did not know what to make of the whole event. And it's in the midst of confusion and lots of emotion that Peter suggests that tents be put up. 
Now, I have to say, if I was up on the mountain later this afternoon and Mary and John and Joseph and Peter and all the disciples showed up, I think I'd want to stay there for a while. I'd want to stay put. I'd want to put up a tent and not just stay for the afternoon, but for days on end to take it all in, to absorb what I could. But Jesus had something else in mind. And while the story may sound bizarre to so many of us years later, and while few of any of us are likely to see a gleaming Jesus on Mount on the Snowmass Mountain, what is clear is that the transfiguration was all about showing the world at the time who Jesus was. And what happens next is interesting. Rather than sitting down, rather than taking time to debrief, debrief his companions, rather than saying, Peter, you're right, let's hold on to this moment and go through it step by step and what it all means. Jesus says, let's go. Let's head off this mountain. No pause, no break. And not only must have Peter and his friends been confused when Jesus then said, by the way, this will make sense when I'm risen from the dead, they could not possibly have known what that meant, and they certainly wanted to figure things out, so the whole thing must have just been totally frustrating. What do you mean, let's go? But Jesus doesn't lay things out. He doesn't explain what happens. He doesn't engage in a question and answer period. And said, Jesus says, get going. Throughout scripture, whether old or new, God has this habit of saying to people, move on, go, get going, don't stay where you are, don't stay put, time for you to grow, time for you to change, time to loosen your grip, time to stop pondering, you need to act, go. And with just those two letters, you can sum up one of the key plot lines of all of scripture, go, go. There's so many examples in scripture Remember, Jeremiah was a young boy. Jeremiah clearly was happy to be a young boy. He said, God, I'm only a boy. But God said, Jeremiah, you may be a young boy and in your young ways, but I say, get up, grow up, and get going. There was a widow. We don't know her name, but she was too poor. We just very poor and had too little to eat. She had a son to care for. And one day, Elijah approaches her and says, go get me some bread, but I don't have any bread. Elijah says, that may be, but go, go get me some bread, go, go out of your insecurity. Peter, one evening on the Sea of Galilee, is in a massive wind-driven storm. He's flipped out, he's hunkering down. Jesus comes to him and says, get out of the boat, come to me, don't stay put. One day there was a man following Jesus and his disciples along the road. The man says, Jesus, I want to follow you, but I have some things to take care of first. Jesus says, that's not the way it works. Come with me right now. In the book of Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament, there's something called the Sabbath year arrangement. Every seven years, people were supposed to cancel all their debts and free all of their slaves. Are we going to hear that scripture? In other words, God said every seven years, let go and start over completely again. Start over. On the first Easter morning, Jesus has been raised from the dead. Women, including several named Mary, met the risen, risen Jesus. They worshiped him. They were clasping his feet, wanting to hold on to him. And Jesus says, stop it, get up and go. And if you take these few stories along with a huge number of others like them, that's what said, God says to you and to me over and over and over and over again. Let go, loosen your grip, get going. And God sends this message in scripture to people despite youth, lack of experience, old age, low confidence, feeling tied down, being burdened or trapped, having piles of unanswered questions, fear, doubt, having long held ways of looking at things, temperament, skill sets, or degree of faith. And it was crystal clear is that this central biblical theme, I believe, is what we are compelled to explore ourselves and what it might mean for each of us in our lives right now. What might God be saying to you and to me right now on this Sunday morning in August about what it is we need to let go of and to move forward with? Every one of us here today, including me, holds on to things, ways of being, ways of thinking, views, perspectives, and looking at things. We all have these ways that we are holding on to. We cling, we grasp, we grip. And as followers of Jesus, I believe it's imperative we regularly ask ourselves, why, 
To what end and for what purpose? Why do I insist on this? Why do I require that? Why is this way of looking at so important to me? Why do I hold so tightly on to what is this that's making me feel so safe and secure? Where is this need to clench coming from? And our answers may help us embrace what is helpful, cause us to be more faithful to God and live more fully. But our answers to such questions may also help us realize there are some things, ways of being, ways of thinking, and ways of living we need to release and let go of if we're going to take following Jesus seriously. Look at church traditions. They've been a blessing and a curse. People beat each other up, burned people at the stake, said they were not being people of faith if they wanted the language translated into the language that people could understand. People killed each other over that. Why? Tradition said blacks are not equal, nor are women. Keep them out of church leadership. People killed over that, that grip of holding on to that. Why? What are our sacred cows, individually, collectively, as the people of the chapel? Which ones are truly sacred? And which ones are essentially cows that God would prefer we put out in the pasture? And I love what one writer says. As people of faith, what cows do we really need to turn into hamburger meat? I think I'm going to get a meat grinder in my office <laughs> to remind me of letting go. But aside from looking at traditions we cling to, most of us in life have experienced what is good and wonderful and a blessing just as God intends, but there are those things in our lives that remain in our lives long past their designated shelf life. And God may call us past fear into the unknown, beyond what we have known to something entirely different but amazing and wonderful and good. That's why it's critical for us to explore such questions as where am I stagnating? Where am I stuck? What am I resisting that keeps coming to mind? What unknowns get to me? What is no longer working if I'm honest with myself about my life? Where is it in life that I have a sense that God might be saying, go, let go, get going, release, move on, embrace what's next, turn to new things? So I believe God's pretty clear on this. There are times we need to go to safe harbor and remain for a while. There's no question about it. Come unto me, all you that are weary, and I will give you rest. There are times to head out into the open sea. But in general, God knows that you and I are made for lives of adventure, to head out, to move on, to let go. We are not made for inertia in any area of life. And we certainly are not made for stagnation in a relationship with Jesus that I hope for all of us is dynamic, changing, growing, transforming, and deepening. I began this morning by sharing the quote, a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. It's a brilliant, brilliant metaphor for us to pay attention to. God calls us to live our lives out to sea. A life that moves and changes and causes us to wonder and explore and instills within us a joyous sense of adventure and a an willingness to embrace whatever it is that God has in mind. So when it's all said and done, I think the takeaway for us this morning is pay attention. Pay close attention. Let us all take the time to wake up and open up our eyes in our own lives, to spend energy figuring out where our ship needs to be. Where is it that we need to head out to sea and let go? Where is it in our life that we need to take some time and safe harbor? Is it time to head out or time to head in? 
But the great news of the gospel of Jesus is regardless of how we answer all these questions, despite how we might be feeling and where we are at the moment, no matter where it is that we feel we're being called to do, remember this. Jesus is in every safe harbor. Jesus is out on every open sea. And Jesus is waiting for you and for me over the glorious horizon in a world we have yet to see. Let us pray.